you're correct. I've been thinking about the past, but like so many in the Emeriti Association, John Brown Childs, no exception, um, being an emerita gives you more free time and more leisure to think larger thoughts. So I've been worrying about this question, the Earth's future, and I keep rephrasing it slightly. My title today is, do humans have what it takes to thrive in this universe? I wouldn't ask this question if I weren't worried about it. So I'm gonna start here with uh, a um, summary of the talk for the benefit of people who can't stay for the entire time. It seems as though, um, as sometimes often happens, uh, my slides are not advancing. So I'm gonna stop sharing for a moment, exercise my, my slides and see if I can come back. So Sandy, sometimes you just have to click on, the, uh, click on it and so yep. that it activates it and then they'll, they'll advance. I, I have um, tried that. <laughs> okay, let's see. There we go. Yep. So here's the summary. Um, we understand Earth's history now in broad outline and there are lessons there. The prime one is we live or die by the laws of physics and that's gonna be true in the future. It's likely that we have hundreds of millions of years of future habitability on Earth. Our cosmic future is bright. And I will argue that it could be very rare in our galaxy. And that has moral and ethical implications, I think. Preserving Earth's future. These are, this, this is my main topic for the second half of the talk. Preserving Earth's future, I think, is a critical moral decision that's currently facing us. But the problem is that as human beings, we don't have consensus on three crucial issues, the long-term economic system, basic principles for managing earth and governing ourselves, and crucially, why earth's long-term health is important. And failure to agree on these questions is really holding up our current efforts to change our usage of energy, preserve the environment, and so on. Now, I do believe that by virtue of an astronomer, being an astronomer, having this cosmic perspective gives me and my fellow astronomers a special advantage here because um, as pointed out by Joel Premack and Nancy Abrams, I see that Nancy's on the line here, it's very important that a society have a commonly agreed to cosmic myth. They've really pointed out the role of cosmologies in previous science societies and how important they are for setting the stage for making decisions. In other words, you really can't decide as a society where you're going if you don't know where you were in the past. And today we're at a special juncture in previous epochs, societies had to make up stories because they didn't know where they came from. We now know. And so I'm going to start this talk, which is aimed at talking about the future. I'm going to actually start it by talking about the modern cosmic myth. So let's go back to a very early time, 10 to the minus 35 seconds, when the universe was had a temperature of 10 to the 27 degrees Kelvin. Unbelievable that we can even speak about these things. And we know that the universe was very hot and very uniform at that time, except it was expanding faster than the speed of light. We could come back to that in the questions. It's actually possible. And when a universe expands faster than the speed of light, it generates matter density energy fluctuations. And the fluctuations were small. They're only about a part in 100,000. But nevertheless, over time, they had profound consequences because where the density was high, gravity was a little bit high. That meant that the expansion was retarded. And by the same token, where the density was low, gravity was low. And those regions managed to expand faster than average. And the net result was that the peaks grew and the valleys also grew. So the universe became 
less and less dense. And ultimately we're left with the universe we have today, which have very dense galaxies um, that are distributed in a much lower density average medium. And so to make a long story short, this is where galaxies come from. And the, the basic story, the basic summary is quantum fluctuations that were generated in a universe expanding faster than the speed of light at a time of 10 to the minus 35 seconds. So that's pretty amazing to be able to say those things. Uh, and I think it's the most amazing discovery ever made by the human beings to be able to speak about a span of density, time, process, temperature um, that spans many, many orders of magnitude. And this is why we're here today. So now it's interesting to actually um, make a picture of that. And there are galaxy simulation codes that now simulate this formation. And I'm showing you an example of one. It put fluctuations in at the very beginning. And now we're looking at the consequences a bit later. The blue material is hydrogen and helium gas that comes out of the Big Bang. And when it falls into dense regions, it makes stars, and the stars are the little white dots. So this is a fairly early time. By the way, this simulation is a picture of what would make a galaxy like the Milky Way. At the er very early time, these density fluctuations are still forming, and the peak falls into a neighboring peak. And this has a big effect on galaxy morphology. The previous stars that have made get thrown into a more or less spherical halo called a spheroid by astronomers. And gas that's still hanging around yet to fall in tends to fall into an outer rotating disk. And then that system collides with another system and you get a bigger spheroid and a refilling disk. So here we're looking close to the end of the simulation. And this is supposed to be what our Milky Way looks like today. All the previous stars that were formed early are this quasi-spherical spheroid, but gas is still falling in and it hasn't yet made stars. And it makes a, a disk in the, of gas in the outer part of the galaxy. Quite beautiful. So now you might say, well, that's a model. Why should we believe that? The reason is that it actually agrees rather well with the pictures of galaxies that we see. Here are some objects that must have formed pretty early and been disrupted. They have rather large spheroids and um, rather lower fraction disk material. And now we can go through a sequence, a famous sequence called the Hubble sequence. The spheroid is going down, the disk is going up, and finally we get to galaxies that are almost pure disk. This indicates the extent to which they've undergone mergers and disruption at various times. I keep speaking of disks, why? Because we see some of these systems edge on and we can see that they're really flattened like dinner plates. And we now know that we live in a system like that. This is the Milky Way, the band of light that crosses the sky looks like a band because we ourselves are in the disk and we know a lot about our the sun's position and motion in the galaxy. So we can look at nearby galaxies and see that their forms reproduce the theory quite well, um, but we can do more with telescopes like Hubble. We can actually look back in time and Hubble is extremely powerful. It takes us back to within about a half a million years of the Big Bang itself. The deepest picture yet taken is this so-called Hubble deep field, ultra deep field. And there are about 10,000 galaxies in this field. It's possible to measure the distance of each one. It's possible to make a movie that travels out in space and back in time. And you can actually see the galaxy shapes and sizes changing just the way the model predicts. So this is additional confirmation. Now, let me take advantage of this picture to take a slight detour and um, wonder, ask you if you're familiar with 
the company called despair.com, they make posters. And I, I love their sense of humor. I'm showing an example here. Basically, it's a picture and then a caption. Opportunity, just because your ship came in doesn't mean you're going places. So they capitalize on this theme and they've made dozens, if not hundreds of funny posters. To some people, the Hubble Deep Field might inspire an astronomy poster. So here's my version of a despair.com. Astronomy, finding out you really just don't matter. Why just feeling overwhelmed that you and your galaxy are just one of 10,000 objects in this picture, actually 100 billion such objects over the celestial sphere. How could you possibly be important? So as you will see by the end of my talk, my message is going to be completely different. Hold that thought though. And let's move on with the cosmic myth. We've made galaxies now. So um, now let's uh, move, take the next step. Galaxies, because they are relatively dense regions, have high enough gas density to make stars. So that little red object that you see in the upper left is a glowing cloud of gas in a neighboring galaxy where stars are forming. And when you look at it with the Hubble Space Telescope, you can see the structure in more detail. Look in the middle, you see those little red dots. Those are the newly formed stars. Fortunately, we have a region right near us where this process is taking place and we can see it in detail. It's called the Sword of the Orion uh, constellation. And if you look closely, you can see that's not a star there. It's a glowing cloud of gas called the Orion Nebula. And here's a montage of Orion at high resolution taken with Hubble. The smooth glowing pictures there are the birth gas uh, from which these stars have formed. And they're very bright, very hot, and their short wavelength photons go out into the interstellar gas and excite it, cause it to glow. And that's where these beautiful colors come from. Now, if you look really closely in this picture, you can see little dark areas and Hubble, thanks to Hubble, we can zoom down into them. Here are some examples. These are solar systems in the process of formation. And in some of them, you can actually see disks, glowing disks, uh, surrounded by gas that's falling onto the disk and making the star and making planets for, uh, we believe. Here are four more of these objects at a later stage in their development after the central star has formed. And you can see that they're surrounded there by the disks of gas and, and uh, dust. And the dust is very important. When we looked at the pictures of galaxies before, I didn't point it out, but should have, there were dark clouds that seemed to be in within the space of the galaxy blocking the light of stars behind. It's that same dust now that has fallen in to make this, um, these uh, disks of circularly rotating gas and, and dust, which are forming planets. So we know that again, they're flattened and rotating because we see some of them edge on. This is an example. And the dust grains are super important. Each one of these dust grains is very small, about the size of cigarette smoke. They're generated in the atmospheres of stars and in supernovae. They're driven out into the interstellar medium where they're collected into new stars and new solar systems. And they're sticky. We don't quite understand the coagulating process. Here's a picture. We start with these tiny dust grains. They make rocky objects. These dust grains are the stuff of which Earth's rocks are made. We make rocky planetesimals, and then in some cases, those planetesimals accrete an atmosphere, and you can get a giant planet that has a rocky core and a huge giant gaseous envelope like Jupiter and Saturn. So here's an artist's conception of what one of those systems might look like. These planetesimals are growing, by gravity, they crash into one another and grow further. So 
I love this next picture, which sort of sums up this whole cycle, this whole process of making a galaxy, making stars, and then making planetary systems. This is a, a real picture taken inside a, a cave in New Mexico. And this is a rocky kiva in the, in the foreground. And here's the Milky Way and those dust clouds in the background are the same stuff of which the rocks in the foreground are made. So this one picture tells the whole story of the formation of Earth, really. So once astronomers tell this story, what everybody wants to know, obviously, is, is Earth rare or is it common? So one view is that Earths are common. And an example of this is the so-called Drake equation. Frank Drake, famous cosmologist uh, and seeker of ex extraterrestrial intelligence, he invented this equation back in the 1960s for the number of detectable intelligent civilizations in the galaxy. And we don't need to go into details, but it starts with the number of stars and then starts multiplying by some factors, which uh, are all less than one, expressing the probability of meeting various requirements. There are only five or six factors in the original equation. And when you multiply by the large number of stars in the galaxy, which is about 100 billion stars, you, you come out with a lot of Earth-type planets in the galaxy using this approach. Since then, we've come to realize that there are other factors needed to make Earth. And that's given rise to something called the rare Earth equation. This is a wonderful book. I recommend it. And um, it also has its own equation, but it has more factors in it. It has six more factors than the original one. <clears throat> one of which, interestingly enough, is whether or not Earth has a big moon. That is now thought to be really important to the habitability of Earth because it stabilizes Earth's axis, which otherwise would wander randomly. Sometimes it would point in the plane of the ecliptic. And therefore, you can just imagine what day and night would look like as we go around the sun. Um, huge temperature differences would be generated on the dark side versus the bright side of Earth. That would generate enormous winds of hundreds of miles an hour and would greatly change the habitability of our planet. The fact that the Earth has had these equable seasons over billions of years is due to the existence of this moon. How was the moon formed? It was formed in an accidental collision with another rather massive body. Um, the two bodies became partially molten. The moon was formed. And um, that's, you know, what is the probability of that happening? That might be incredibly low. Well, um, I decided I would write down all the factors that I could think of what it really takes to make Earth as we know it, that's key, you know. Maybe intelligent life could exist on other planets that we don't know, but I came up with 17 factors for the habitability of, of Earth as we know it, or the nature of Earth as we know it. And so if, you, if each one of these factors has a probability of 0.1, I'm picking that out of the air, and there are 100, billion stars in the galaxy, then the probability of Earth is only, in the whole galaxy, is only one in a million. So when you hear reports, as we often do, of the discovery of planets around every star, um, not, not every planet is going to be habitable. And when you put together all of these interesting factors for Earth, you could get a very different story. I'm going to come back to the implications of rare earth later in the talk. Okay, in addition to being a great planet today, earth has a, a wonderful future. That's something nice about cosmology and astronomy. We study the history of earth that allows us to predict what's going to happen going forward. And without going into details, our cosmic future is bright for I would say at least a few hundred million years. Uh, First and foremost, we have a very stable solar system, 
with planets in circular orbit. So there's no danger in our solar system of waiting, waking up and listening to the radio or reading on Facebook that, uh oh, guys, um, an instability in planetary interactions is ejecting the Earth into the interstellar medium away from the sun. And in a few years, um, it's going to be freezing cold here. So, um, you know, <laughs> don't even bother writing your will because the whole planet is going to freeze to death. No, we're very lucky. And that's not true in other solar systems, by the way. They are unstable and they do eject their planets. So to make a long story short, probably our biggest vulnerability is super volcanoes which is the biggest threat of mass extinction. The last such extinction was 250 million years ago. And I don't know of any way of protecting against this. It needs further study by Earth and planetary scientists. Bottom line is though that we've got a lot of time at our disposal. Okay, so what are some lessons here from what I've been calling the modern cosmic myth? Lesson number one, we really understand all the pieces of the story. We don't have to appear, appeal to miracles at any stage to get us here. Once we have a big bang, that's a mystery where that came from. But once we have a big bang as we know it to have been, we're going to, um, it's going to make stars and it's going to make planets. It's going to make earth. We are subject to those laws and must live within them. And that's the lesson going forward. How we manage the earth we can't make up miracles for managing Earth. How we do it is going to be subject to the laws of physics. Um, there were no miracles in our past and there will be none in our future. Lesson two, Earth will provide a livable home for at least 100 million years and maybe longer. We've been given the gift of a beautiful planet and cosmic time. And are we going to use this well or are we going to squander it? And the interesting point is, of course, is that we're the first generation of human beings to know these facts and therefore to face this challenge. So I now will move from uh, the modern cosmic myth to its implications moving forward. Three things that we need to be talking about in order to manage our planet well, but we are not. So I'll start by asking you this number. What is this number? Well, it turns out that that is the number, if you raise it to a power of a million, equals a factor of two. Why am I talking about this? Because this is the amount of annual growth in Earth's economy that can be tolerated if the total growth over a million years should be no more than a factor of two. What I'm talking about here is that we're now economically running up against the boundaries of the planet. In contrast, what is this number, 1.03 to a power million? It's a huge number, 10 to whatever this is now, 10 to the 12 or 13,000. What is that? That is capitalism's target 3% growth compounded over a million years. Again, we're running up against the boundaries of the planet. And many uh, environmentalists and environmental economists are worried now that this target growth of 3%, let alone a million years, can't really be sustained for more than another few decades. So that brings us to the topic of capitalism, which um, we don't have any agreement over. One view regards it as this rosy, reassuring picture. Capitalism by its nature, by its nature, entails a constant process of motion, growth, and progress. That's fine as we live on an infinite planet, but we don't. So I am waiting to see the following from a mainstream economist, that stocks are Ponzi schemes premised on future growth Capitalism does not bestow growth as an option, it needs it. It feeds on it and in the process, it's devouring our planet. Mainstream neoliberal economics traditionally does not cost ecosystem services 
having treated them as somehow externalities that will just appear by magic, this is changing, but it's not changing fast enough really to influence um, the kinds of policy changes that we need if we're going to uh, deal properly with this unending growth. Okay, so not everybody agrees with me. Here's the famous John Bogle who invented Vanguard funds. He says capitalism is not a Ponzi scheme. It is a scheme of free markets. Well, it can be both. It's not one or the other. I certainly agree that it's a scheme of free markets and that free markets are very efficient at allocating resources. I don't think I would want to change that in, to any great degree, but nevertheless, the growth aspect needs to be addressed. History says otherwise about growth. Here's annual copper production, which has grown at 3.3% for 110 years and is still continuing that way um, to the present. Um, here's not in, in addition to, to resource consumption, we have to bar, worry about the other environmental the absorption of our wastes, including, say, plastic waste. And plastic waste has grown at 7% for the last 65 years. Now, a really tough question here in, in alerting people and trying to get them to think about these issues is a very deeply held view by many that somehow technology is going to save us. What do we mean by save us? What it means is that we're going to prove, um, produce as much in the future with actually less raw material consumption. This concept is called dematerialization of the economy. And we should be asking ourselves, will new technology somehow help that to occur? So, People write papers on this subject. This is an example in which some folks studied 57 different industries. And it turns out that the important things are two numbers. One is this question kappa, which is technical performance. That is to say the degree to which in this industry, technology is letting us do more with less. And then epsilon, is the percent demand increase for per, per percent increase in national income. So uh, if epsilon is very big, well, let's put it the other way. If epsilon is very small and nobody wants your product, then it's, it's easy to dematerialize. But if your product's in demand, you have to make more of it and it's harder to de dematerialize. So you can see how it's a balance versus these two numbers. And the good region is the orange region. And the real points for these industries are the little blue diamonds. And the net result was not one single industry was found to be within its orange region and many are very, very far away. And this I think is obvious, you know, because really new technology can't substitute for really basic things like copper. Copper makes all of our electronics and it's, it's hard to make Elect more electronics without using more copper. Okay, so to summarize, none of these 57 sectors was within the de dematerializing zone and most are far, very, very far away. So our economy, as it grows, consumes more and it consumes more natural resources and it produces more waste. And this is burdening our planet. Okay, so this is a good moment to think for a moment about oil. Uh, I'm gonna ask you some questions rhetorically about oil. Um, let's, let's consider how much freight an 18 wheeler truck can haul going 700 miles. The answer is it can haul 45,000 pounds. How much does the diesel fuel in it weigh? 600 pounds. Supposing we had an electric truck, how much would the batteries weigh? 45,000 pounds. So how much freight can a battery powered, lithium battery powered truck 
all 700 miles? The answer is no freight. The moral here is you, you can think about electric cars, but you really can't think about electric trucks. They violate the laws of physics. Now, in some sense, and by the way, this is important for all heavy, heavy machinery. This is the same problem for agricultural machinery for, and for mining machinery, uh, certainly for airplanes. <laughs> you can't fly, you cannot operate many, many of our machines on um, electric energy. Now, given then that oil is, is really irreplaceable, how much are we paying for it? I was speaking about free markets. Are free markets properly pricing oil? Well, here's another series of questions, okay? This is the, the energy density. I should have summarized this before, 50 times that of lithium batteries. Let's think though about the price of, of oil. How many person days of labor energy are there in your last tank of gas? Uh, you know, people are able to produce BTUs at some rate. Your gas tank does the same thing and has a certain number of BTUs in it. How many days, seconds, years, whatever, would it take a person, a healthy person working to generate the same amount of energy that's in your gas tank? This blew me away when I learned this recently. The answer is five years five years of human labor. How much would you pay a person to work that long at a decent way, not generous, $250,000? And how much did you pay for the gas? You paid $50 for that gas, maybe a bit more since I made this slide. Dividing, you could make the, the argument that oil is arguably underpriced by a factor of 5,000. And why is this important? Well, it's important for two reasons. First of all, we are living in a fossil fuel bubble. And if we took this oil and coal away, we're gonna go back to a, what I call a wood and wagon world. Wood, because wood will be our major source of fuel and extra energy. And wagons, because our transport will be wagons pulled by horses. Uh, it's that transformation over the past couple hundred years that is the difference between the modern world and the previous world. Don't think of it as technology. Don't think of it as scientific knowledge. Don't think of it as a superior political system. Those things are all products of this transformation. The fact that each one of us today has the equivalent of a hundred people working for us, a hundred manpowers working for us, thanks to fossil fuel. So that's very important. This is why we're here today. And it's important going forward because we speak of building new infrastructure with new sources of energy, photovoltaics, wind power, for example. But those are all machines made in factories with raw materials that are mined and at the moment, our technology requires using oil, to some degree coal, but really oil in order to assemble those new machines. If we burn up all the oil without having set in place our new infrastructure, then we really will be doomed to a wood and wagon world. Okay, so to summarize, thing one, there's no serious discussion taking place on the ephemeral nation, nature of our oil-based capitalist system or the profound transformation that lies just around the corner when fossil fuels run out. Okay, let me move to my second thing that we're not talking about and that is an understanding of earth and us on it as a system. So I'm emphasizing here the human nature dynamic, not just nature by itself, but what happens when you combine humans and their consumption of resources with human society. So there's this cute little paper published a few years ago by some folks at the University of Maryland, and it, it attempts 
and a very, very simple way to model this. So there are four equations in this little model, differential equations, and the equations talk to one another. As one term changes in one equation, it affects the term in the neighboring equation. There are two kinds of people in this model, the elite and the commoners. And wealth is managed purely by the elite. For everything that is produced in this society, the elites get more of it according to this inequality factor, kappa equals 100. And that allows them to accumulate wealth. And um, they accumulate wealth from the work of everyone else. And when there's a crisis, for example, a famine, the elite can spend their wealth for a while to buy food and survive longer. This lulls them into a false sense of security, or at least it can. Meanwhile, commoners are dying, but for a while the, the, the elite are still surviving and doing okay. This little set of equations, which has eight different coefficients in it, is capable of wildly different behavior depending on the nature of the coefficients. This is what happens when you integrate those coefficients going forward over time. And it's very easy to have a situation in which there's a total collapse. When nature is overdrawn and the plight of the workers is ignored, um, the commoners survive, um, the elite survive a bit longer, but then they collapse. There's some lessons in this little simple set of, of uh, equations. And of course, it's no accident that even though they're very simple, they are in some sense encapsulating what we're doing today to nature and how we interact with each other. So lesson number one here is the existence of wealth, which as I said, allows the elites to ignore the plight of the commoners and deny the prospect of impending doom. In other words, wealth creates a time delay. And when you have these couple differential equations, a time delay is absolutely the recipe for oscillatory and out of control behavior. The next feature of this set of equations is the inequality factor, which represents the wealth in elites versus commoners. And the people who made this particular set of equations found that if K is greater than 10, collapse is inevitable. Commoners starve first, but elites starve later. And of course, this makes us think about um, growing wealth inequality in our societies and around the world really today. So this tells you that um, wealth inequality can lead to societal collapse. Has collapse occurred to societies in the past? Yes, right? Famous author, Jared Diamond, great author of Guns, Gerald, Germs and Steel wrote this book on how societies choose to fail or succeed. And the lessons in this little set of equations are, have been reiterated time over time to societies in the past. Okay, so this brings me to thing two. We don't have any collective understanding across the globe of our planet as a dynamic system for harboring intelligent life. We don't acknowledge the instabilities that are inherent in our complex socioeconomic system and what we need to do to tame them, for example, by reducing kappa. And we don't understand the long-term requirements for natural resources and waste reprocessing in any quantitative way. And as a result, for both of these reasons, we don't understand the planet's long-term carrying capacity over cosmic time. And that's a number that we need to know. So that brings me to the future and in particular, the ethics of the future. Let me speak first about the origin of human ethics. We can't talk about our ethical compass for the future without knowing why we have an ethical system. And here again is a question on which there is no agreement among human beings. Where do our ethical principles come from? The, I would say the vast majority of people on the planet think that they are divinely given. So they believe something like this, something like the, the, ton, the Ten Commandments 
from the Bible. God spake all these words saying, etc. That would make them absolute, but external. Other people think, like Kant, they don't believe in God, but they still think that moral principles, at least some of them, are absolute. Do the right thing because it is right. This is what we often call the Kantian imperative. But more and more, I think a new view is coming to the fore. And that is the fact that our human ethical system is really just a product of natural selection. For example, E.O. Wilson, who was one of the pioneers here, had passed away pretty recently. He said, most behavioral scientists agree that ethical codes have arisen by evolution through the interplay of biology and culture. Cooperative individuals generally survive longer and leave more offspring. Well, that raises absolutely the key ethical problem confronting every human being. When am I going to serve myself? I have to come first in some sense. But when am I going to serve others, my, my progeny, my spouse, my community, because I depend on them too. So I think this could be summed up by saying that ethics, human ethics are a pragmatic tool for decision-making and the function of morality, says Dean Peterson, or our moral organ equivalently, is to negotiate the inherent serious conflict between self and others. This is a very practical statement about human ethical systems. Now, this is a very interesting point. Why, why do we comply? If, if our ethics is built in, in some sense, it can be tuned by upbringing. I'm not saying that culture has no role, but the fact that we need have an ethical system is inborn. And what is the, the factor that makes us comply? when it's telling us to do something. And the answer is feelings. Feelings are the carrot and stick that compel our compliance. And here is a, a, a psychologist from South Africa, Mark Solms, who studied this. Uh, the good feelings associated with functions necessary for survival is what motivates us to do them. And I love this quote from Abraham Lincoln. When I do good, I feel good. When I do bad, I feel bad. That is my religion. And interestingly, I came to this conclusion about myself a couple of decades ago, and it was one of the realizations that sort of prompted this whole exploration that I've been making since then. Let me take a short detour here and say that <clears throat> um, you can confront people with circumstances and put them in MRI machines and see what their brains are doing. And when they experience these feelings of remorse, sadness, fear, et cetera, all the sticks and carrots in our ethical system, you can see what, what regions of their brain are activated. And it's not the prefrontal cortex, it's deep, it's the limbic system, it's the brainstem. And uh, that tells us that, these, that this mechanism for making an organism do one thing or another that's good for its survival is ancient. And that suggests that animals have it too. And I submit to you, if you think about it, what is sentience? It's not being able to do calculus. It's not making a grocery, grocery list. It's actually, I think, first and foremost, being able to feel something and be aware that you're feeling something. And if that is true, then a the vast family tree of animals is, qualifies as being sentient. Okay, let me get back to the, my main track. Having discussed the origin of our ethical principles, now let's think about the implications for how we value the future because value is at the core of ethics. If we value something, we protect it and we make moral decisions to do that. So, um, you would think that because there are probably lots more people in the future, that if we were trying to protect and do good for them, that our primary goal should be to ensure that the future goes well for all generations to come. 
But the problem is how much do we value those future generations? And that is, comes to the core of the human ethical system. We discount the future. Uh, an example is the exponential discount rate that we apply to the future value of money. Um, that's often what we call the interest rate, or here I'm showing a, a slide of federal funds rate over the last 60 years or so, which is average 2%. What does this mean? It means that if somebody says, <clears throat> I'm going to give you a dollar a year from now, you say, no, you're not. I, I could have that dollar now. If I have to wait, you have to pay me more. You have to pay me if, if you were going to if I'm going to lend you a dollar and you're going to pay it back a year from now, you're going to pay me a dollar and two cents. That's a discount rate. It's effectively saying that the value of money in the future is less than the value of money today. And this is crucial because this is how people compute whether or not a construction project is going to be, is going to make money or not. They build in this discount factor. And supposing that that project is a, a new form of energy generating plant that will do so more efficiently. Nevertheless, we've sort of automatically built in the fact that the energy that it returns in the future is going to be discounted in value at 2% per year. This matters um, because it adds up over time or more specifically, it multiplies over time. At a discount rate of 2%, your 80th year is worth only 30% of your current year when you are 20 years old. So people, and people actually do think this way. It's not just an economic thing. This is why we find it hard to save for our retirement because that seems very distant and so, somehow in some sense worth less to us. Also, over time, at a discount rate of 2%, these future generations, even though there be lots of people, have essentially zero value, even though there may be a lot of them put together this discount rate for a thousand years, and it basically goes to zero. So why is this? Now we have, we can see the whole picture. Humans have a weak moral organ for the distant future because having one was not necessary for our evolutionary success to this time. We only need to think about uh, the next few years or a few decades in order to survive uh, successfully. We have to preserve our bodies in order to be able to reproduce and we need to raise our children to their age of reproduction. That's a total time of two generations, something like that, 40 years. We can think on timescales like that, and we can have feelings of worth and value over timescales like that. But longer than that, we cannot because we were not shaped by evolution to think that way or feel that way. So that brings me to thing three. We have no collective agreement on where our human ethical principles come from and their relation to planning Earth's future. In short, we don't understand what it means to be a human being. Okay, here's some evidence that humans actually do care at least a little bit about Earth's far future. When I've given this talk in person, I often start it by asking the audience the following question. Imagine Earth a thousand years from now, and just take it for granted that it's a smoking ruin and that human actions starting with our generation today are responsible for that. And the question is, is this good or bad? And 95% of the people in the audience say that it's bad. And the other few percent either don't know or they don't get the question or some say it's good, but they, they think it's good because there aren't any humans anymore and it's good for the planet if there are no humans. Point is, though, that most people react with revulsion to this prospect. And I've been asking myself, why is that? Why do we care about planet Earth many generations hence when we seem to operate our lives with this discount factor? And here is my explanation, um, which I think could actually be pursued with research. So here, I think, 
I have to introduce this concept of entropy, which is, comes from physics. Basically, if entropy is low, it means that whatever you're looking at, a machine, a collection of atoms, whatever, a human brain is complex and highly organized. And if something has high entropy, it means it's disorganized, it's, um, it becomes more uniform, it becomes less interesting in some, in some sense. I'll give you an example. Imagine that you're holding a teacup. It's highly organized. It was crafted uh, to do a certain job. People put energy and effort into it to arrange the atoms that way. And you drop the teacup on your kitchen floor and that organization is lost. Uh, the atoms disperse in a more or less uniform way over a large area. And in the process, its function is lost, its utility is lost, okay? That's an example of going from a low entropy state to a high entropy state. And now, how do you feel about that? You're shocked. Oh my God, my cup broke. And then, you know, imagine that was a valuable Chinese vase that had managed to resist the forces of degradation and destruction for thousands of years and you dropped it. Oh, how horrible you would feel, you would feel even worse. Okay. Somebody dies, we feel sadness at this. Why? I think I would offer to you, in addition to the personal importance of the person, of, but in addition to that, this was a remarkable arrangement of atoms that made a living, breeding, thinking, speaking individual. And after death, all of that will disperse and decay and that complexity is lost. All of these are examples of going from a low entropy state to a high entropy state. And I submit to you that honoring low entropy is actually the ultimate human value. Uh, and this is where earth comes in because Earth is a planet, a place in the universe, unlike any other that we have ever seen, where the conditions are such that you can make low entropy. And it's due to the fact that we have a sun over there that is sending light to us from just one direction. Uh, that is a, a reservoir of low entropy that's coming to us all the time. And um, the net result is perhaps a a region of the universe in which things, interesting things can happen, which are rare or non-existent anywhere else. So that would be a reason for us to value earth in much the same way that we value Yosemite. We see that that's a very special place on earth. Perhaps earth is special in the galaxy. Maybe it deserves to be the first galactic national park. And do we need a new religion that worships Earth's spectacular ability to generate low entropy enclaves where ever more complex and beautiful phenomena can grow? Can this thought be the germ of a new ethical system for the future that doesn't have this deadly discount factor in it? Okay, so at UCSC, we are trying to deal with some of these questions by creating something called an Earth Futures Institute. What would it do? Um, here are some, some bullet points for it. Um, models showing Earth's long-term carrying capacity. Uh, the consideration of an economic, stable economic systems that would get by with less energy and don't depend on growth. Governance systems that of human society that damp out instabilities and um, consideration of our moral compass for the future. Should we teach our youngsters from birth where our values really come from? Shall we find out whether or not human ethics can morph going forward? And can we come to love the earth enough to save it? Now, here are, I think, are some very urgent questions that need immediate attention. I believe, I've come to believe that in the next few decades, say three, four, five, we are going to undergo this transition from a, a society and an economy that is living on oil and fossil fuels 
to um, one that will has to get along without those things. We burned up half the oil. We're discovering oil at a much slower rate than we're actually burning it. So this transition is coming and I'm worried this is gonna come within the lifetime of my grandchildren, and perhaps yours. So I think we need to worry about what life might look like after most of the oil is gone. Best case, we're going to use remaining fossil fuels in order to build new infrastructure. Worst case, we're gonna to fail to do that. And instead, when fossil fuels run out, we're going to fall rapidly to a wood, into a wood and wagon world. Now, I, I think what we need to do is ask the question, how will transiting to A or B affect the following? If we're in case A or case B, what's going to happen to the climate? What's going to happen to the energy supply for all of these things? Heating, lighting, transport, industry, agriculture. Will plants continue to grow? Will we have fuel to run the agricultural machines? What's going to be the demand on natural resources? I'll just give you a tidbit. Supposing we converted all the cars in the world to electric cars, how much, by what factor would we have to increase the rate at which we mine lithium and cobalt? The answer is a factor of 30 in order, and that would have to be sustained as long as we're running cars on electric batteries. I keep giving you these statistics in order to bring home the quantitatively how dire and enormous these challenges are that are facing us. When the planet warms, <clears throat> If it warms five, four degrees from, from now, um, a quarter of the world will either have to move or die. And I'm not talking about not being able to grow plants, I'm talking because it will just be too warm for their bodies. We are right on the tipping point. At the moment, there is no region of the planet that is intrinsically too hot for a human being to survive without air conditioning. But if the planet goes up in temperature four degrees, a quarter of the people will find themselves in dire straits and will have to move or die. That's what I think the most basic meaning of, of global warming means. It means that people will not be able to live because their bodies will not survive. Uh, okay, what's gonna to happen to the economic system? Um, the free market economy is not properly allocating our fossil fuels, capitalism may be facing the end of growth, and all of these stresses, what's going to happen to our political system? Uh, the government, I believe, needs to intervene. How will these stresses and decline, possible decline, probable decline of standard of living affect our democracies? Okay, so I, sh I should, um, I think, try to sum up uh, more quickly here, the two big near-term threats, end of growth, the end of fossil fuels, we're not moving effectively to prepare. My opinion, government has to take the lead and can democracies save now in order to preserve their own futures for future generations? I think that's the big question. What should we do, you and I, read, think, be able to imagine a world that's different from the world we have today and speak up, which is what I'm trying to do in giving talks like this. So let me close here with this picture. Uh, it, I think it's one of the most staggeringly beautiful pictures ever taken by astronomers. You'll recognize it, it's the planet Saturn, but the Cassini spacecraft flew around behind the planet and took a picture of Saturn from the backside so that the sun is eclipsed. It's a wonderful picture, illustrates our ability to navigate the solar system. But my reason for showing it is that it's also a picture of Earth. So let me give you a little help in seeing that. Perhaps still you may actually even a little bit more help. So. Where is Earth? There's Earth. Okay. 
So most people, I think, um, don't realize that Earth as seen from Saturn is this incredibly insignificant little thing. <laughs> uh, and since I love despair posters, this inspires a possible despair poster. <laughs> astronomy finding out you really just don't matter. I hope it's clear from what I've been saying though that quite the opposite. I think Earth is an incredible place and it's rare. It should trigger all of our instincts to preserve low entropy and create places, complex places, preserving that possibility of continued development to the future. And astronomy helps us with this message so this is my anti-despair poster inspiring us to protect Earth's future. So thank you for listening to me today. And I hope we will have a discussion because I've said quite a few controversial things. And I'd like to hear what you think about these questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. OK, thank you very much, Sandy. All right, in this group, there have to be some questions. All right. Questions for Sandy. Uh, start with Eli. Actually, I have a couple. That was such an awesome talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, this question is, um, when I think of um, what I read about uh, Native American populations, um, they were thinking of the future, and they weren't um, simply abandoning the earth um, and abandoning future generations. It would, be, uh, it would be great if we could incorporate more of that into our thinking. It's interesting you say that. I think um, I very much share your view and I think they could bring a wonderfully different perspective to the table. We just brought, Earth Futures Institute just brought a Canadian artist I think art has a lot to say about this too, um, in helping to frame the stories here that will appeal to our, uh, our ethical and moral system, which responds better to stories and emotions than it does to data. So to make a long story short, um, we're beginning to explore contacts with the local Amamutsun tribe who are trying to restore their pre-colonial agriculture and knowledge of local plants. And it would be wonderful to speak with them uh, and make contact. Uh, uh, Mr. Lopez, the tribal chairman, is an outstanding individual with a great deal of wisdom on many topics. So thanks for that point. And I really hope to pursue it in the near future. Great. Uh, the second question, had to do with right at the beginning of your talk, you talked about something that I thought was quite illegal or quite against the law, and that is um, the early universe moving faster than the speed of light. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't hear. Uh, no, I, I, I slid over that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me just give you an example, though. Um, so supposing there's a very small dense mass here and you're over here, I can't leave the screen here, you're over here and you, and you drop a particle. Let me do it this way since it's more evocative. Okay, so uh, obviously the particle accelerates and you watch it from your vantage point. You see it um, redshifting away from you, right? because it's moving away and from the Doppler shift, it's light that it's emitting is moving towards longer wavelengths. So at the same time, it's accelerating, it's going faster and faster, the shift gets bigger and bigger. Uh, so what happens, let's make this thing a black hole. There's a sphere around it. And when the object reaches that radius, it is going with respect to you at the speed of light but it's also infinitely redshifted. So it's been redshifted out of sight. So the object relative to you and your universe is going faster than the speed of light. It's just that you can't see it. <clears throat> it disappears at that point. So that's part of the way of solving this 
general statement that objects can't go faster than the speed of light. They can under the influence of gravity over large distances. Hmm. So the expanding universe uh, in the inflation period is like a black hole turned inside out. So if you sit here and watch a particle nearby, uh, it begins to accelerate away from you faster and faster than the speed of light. And it also gets redshift and it disappears in the process. But the fabric of the universe everywhere, pieces relative to other pieces are moving apart faster than the speed of light. And it's, it's a form of gravity that's doing that. That's the point I'm trying to make. Mm -hmm. um, John, did you have a question? So you turned on, you turned off your microphone. Yeah, yes, I have. Uh, thank you so much. That was just wonderful. And I, I hope more and more people will get to hear what you have to say. It's just fantastically important. Um, I, in fact, I think of what I'd like to do is send you a copy of my book, Transcommonality. I was thinking of that yeah, as you were the, speaking. I would love to have a copy. Thank you so much. The subtitle is From the Politics of Conversion to the Ethics of Respect. There, and absolutely. So, uh, I, right. I it's, a, it's um, Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you. Um, I was just wondering, as you've given this talk, uh, what kinds of responses have you received from people? Very positive. Good. But um, I feel that the people who come to my talks, um, I'm preaching to the choir. Mm -hmm. And let me also say that um, I think the real question is, you know, we're all to we're all responsible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when when I drive my car, I live in Los Gatos. When I drive my car from Los Gatos to Santa Cruz, you know, yeah. I'm I'm living off the fruits of fossil fuels. Um, and I guess the I don't sit here blaming CEOs of oil companies. They can't really do much else under the current system. They have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders. Mm -hmm. The whole, we're just like flies in amber. We're trapped in the system. Yeah. And so the thing I think we, we have to think about is where are the levers? Mm. And uh, I think it's really, it's, it, it's really a disservice, especially that our editorial pages are just not waking up to this. Mm -hmm. I read the Wall Street Journal every day. Those are smart people. How could they possibly be missing these things? And they have bully pulpits that would potentially influence the political system. But um, bottom line is, I'm thinking about this, but I don't really have a path to um, making change on the short time scale that's really needed. So suggestions yeah. are, are needed. I don't want to write just another book. These are wonderful books that people are writing, and they don't make any difference either, et cetera. It's a real challenge. I agree. It is. Yeah. It's a very big challenge. But thank you. I, I you know, thank you from the heart. You're, you're okay. doing such important work. Thanks. Todd? Oh, muted. Uh, in terms of energy, what do you think of, of hydrogen as a mm -hmm. fuel source and nuclear energy? Um, I need to read more about the economics of each one of these uh, options. I was just reading two days ago about hydrogen and have the impression that it's just, um, uh, you would have to have enormous amounts of probably solar power in order to make it um, energetically feasible. I mean, the fact is, a hydro there's a reason why hydrogen is hooked up to oxygen, right? It's energetically favorable. You have to put in a lot of energy to get it back. It's not as though we have hydrogen lying around. So I, I would dismiss hydrogen. Um, nuclear, I'm a fan of, not for cosmic time, but as a Band-Aid to get us through this transition process. And I think it's criminal that there are other new forms of nuclear power plants that are safer uh, with more disposable radioactive waste. And uh, that's just not being pursued in our country and should be. Okay, Jack, I think you had a question and uh, unmute. 
You're muted, Jack. Uh, Jack, you're muted. How's that now? Good. The question is about population growth. Uh, uh, it's, it's not particularly uh, looking at a long-term uh, growth uh, at a constant rate um, is a little misleading because population is a major driver. Um, and I have two questions. First, it looks like um, fertility rates are coming down so that maybe population is not going to grow indefinitely. And what do you think is, is the carrying capacity under uh, successful conditions of population? And it's certainly lower than what it is now. So that how do we go from where we are to a much lower figure? Well, I think in the end, population growth is not going to be important uh, because like everything about our world, it's happened because of fossil fuels. The population didn't grow. By the way, you said properly that population growth is an element in the growth of the economy. It's about 50% of it. So of this 3%, about half of it, 1.5% has been driven recently by population growth. But you know, if you go back to the Roman Empire or the Egyptians and et cetera, et cetera, population was hardly growing. And it began to balloon exactly at the point where we began to master and become, um, you know, at our, have at our disposal all this energy. So when, the ener when fossil fuels go away, I, I think uh, not only will there be catastrophes because agriculture will be less productive, we can't make fertilizers, we can't run the machines, we can't transport the goods. The, trans the transformation is going to be huge. So in some sense, the population problem in all likelihood is gonna solve itself. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. What was your second question? How, how do we go from? Ah, do you, the question was, what's the, what do I think the real carrying capacity is? Capacity. Yeah, uh, I think this is the uh, um, $64 question. Um, if you really think on cosmic time, I, I actually think that there are thermodynamic limits and um, waste disposal limits that are just as important as resource consumption. I think it's 1% of what we have today, mm -hmm. which is like the state of California. I can imagine the state of California population surviving for a very, very long period of time on a big planet. I feel sort of safe with that. That's a huge reduction. I think most people are thinking, well, maybe not 8 billion, but 1 billion or something like that. No, I think it's much, much lower. But I frankly am pulling that number out of the air. And that's one of the big numbers that we need to think about and do studies to address. So I'm very conservative, but it could be completely wrong. Roger. Thank you. Yeah, uh, again, Sandy, very nice talk. But I have a question about your slide going from A to B, where B is, of course, the horse and buggy kind of thing. And what I guess I'm curious about is, first of all, whether the time scale for such a transformation will make any difference. In other words, are we more likely to solve a problem if that is quickly perceived as something imminently uh, likely, or there's a longer period of time? I suspect that something of a more short-term shock is what's really required mm -hmm. here. I mean, I'm kind of thinking of the whole question of the space race and the fact that Sputnik certainly for scientists of our generation was very important in terms of getting the support that we have relied on. Interesting. And so is there something which could shock people into paying attention to this um, without uh, 
uh, and still when there is time. Mm. So what are what are your thoughts about that? That's I, that's the other sixty four dollar question, and whether or not things have to get much worse before they'll get proper attention. You know, I'm sitting here in my home. I'm looking out at the garden. It's a beautiful sunny day. What could be wrong? <laughs> And the, and the problem is, of course, that so many of these issues are hidden or they're latent problems that are building up out of sight and, and then suddenly will erupt and, and come to bite us. Uh, have you read Ministry for the Future by no. Kim Stanley Robinson? Um, yeah. Okay, so that's, a, that's for pe people interested in the future, that's a science fiction book, but nevertheless tried to be very true to life and and bring in some imaginative thinking. The event that got their attention in that story, which is written in a very beautiful way, was a heat wave in India that killed 20 million people. And I think he, I think he triggered exactly the event that is most likely going to get attention. It will be some horrible heat wave and millions of people will die. Uh, and when the, India is an excellent place for that. India is very much at risk for um, becoming uninhabitable with higher temperatures. So perhaps it's that. Then the other obviously is the collapse of the of the ice shelf in, in West Antarctica, which would raise the sea level instantly by a meter or so, I think it is. And that would have major consequences as well. But if you're thinking of really abrupt short-term events that will be shocks, as you put it, those are the two that I can think of. Thank you. Okay, I think we'll, we'll take a couple more here. Uh, clearly lots of interest. Nancy. By the way, Nancy is a veteran here and <laughs> has done, uh, she and Joel together have done as much as any two people in the world to get us thinking about the future. So thank you, Nancy. Oh, thank you, Sandy. That was such a good talk. Um, however, I think that um, the alternative to oil is not going to be wood and wagons. Oh, what is it? It's going to be slavery. Um, mm. If you look at the ancient world, that was the main source of energy for the elites. And uh, if you look at when it stopped, it was in the 19th century, just when we started burning oil. A point that I have uh, thought myself, absolutely, yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. and sadly, um, one of the reasons that it stopped was because we had oil, we could afford to be moral. Mm -hmm. We could afford to make a moral decision. Yes. But if we cannot afford to make a moral decision, we won't make a moral decision. So I hope that in the future, when you talk about this, instead of saying wooden wagons, you'll point this out, that really, okay. we will go back to slavery. There will be no other source of energy. We can't, there are no forests to burn. There aren't enough forests to burn. Yeah, that's uh, in, in, in many places. Yep. Um, I, I hope I hinted as much when I mentioned the stresses on democracy. I think it's no accident that there was the enlightenment and a new vision for democratic order was also brought in right when um, coal and oil began to be supreme. And I, I really think our whole risk, the whole structure of society is going to change if we take this energy away. I think you'll scare people more if you if you really mention it, slavery coming back. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Not that you need to scare us more than this. Okay, I'm gonna let Rousey go first and then Jim. Okay, hi, hi Sandra. Um, the earth is not going away. Are you convinced that a superior intelligence might come if humans go away. I mean, convinced that a superior intelligence might not come if humans go away. Mm. I'm not convinced of that, no. But possibly? <laughs> possibly. I don't know that that changes my thinking about what we should do today, though. Hmm. <laughs> OK, Jim? Two other thoughts, Sandy, as you continue to talk to other people about it. One is that the talk, how it's wonderful, of course, is still a bit American-centric and anthropocentric. So by American-centric, I mean, we've just lived through two years 
where the contrast, the moral contrast between the United States and as the Times pointed out earlier this week, Australia with very similar demographics, but had a factor of 10 <clears throat> lower death rate in COVID because of societal response means that not all countries on the planet currently are morally comparable in, these, in thinking about um, uh, indivi individual rights versus collective rights, which is one of the points that you made. So to an American audience, you could point that out. And by anthropogenic, I mean, <clears throat> at times you talk about um, livability, but life is, is broader than sentient life. And most people thinking about livability think of human life. And as Rusty just said, the planet, life on the planet is likely to survive quite well, thank you. It's been through massive uh, destructions of life in the past and rebounded. It's just us who are affected by it. Um, can I respond to your two points? Mm -hmm. Okay, so point number one, um, yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned Australia because I was just reading about them yesterday. Yes, perhaps they marshal more effectively for COVID, but actually they stand out in sure. plots of environmental destruction and consumption. Yeah. Uh, on that score, they're doing actually worse than the United States. Agreed. And I, I guess I would say there are really no winners there except maybe Bhutan. Uh, you know, all, all societies everywhere are, are ex heavily exploiting their own environment. So mm -hmm. as far, perhaps it's within the human moral realm to respond to COVID. It doesn't seem yet to be within our moral realm to respond to the environment crisis. Regarding anthropogenic, I am anthropogenic. <laughs> and I will confess to say that unashamedly. <laughs> and the reason is that I think uh, part of the, uh, a major part of the awe and wonder of earth is humans and what they've done. And to go back to uh, uh, an earth where there really isn't intelligent civilization, people aren't thinking thoughts. And by the way, I don't think our descendants have to be humans. They could be machines. They could be, you know, I'm not wedded to the human species per se. I'm just wedded to the notion that there will be beings uh, on a future earth who will breaking, be breaking new grounds in terms of aesthetics, complexity, knowledge, whatever. Okay. And uh, that, that sort of fits with my statement that uh, low entropy is a miracle and human society is the pinnacle of that. All right, well, thank you very much, Sandy. I think, I think we'll bring it to a close. That, that's a good closing statement. Uh, so thank you uh, everybody for your participation in American Emeriti activities this year. Uh, as of right now, we don't have a summer activity. Maybe if the uh, COVID finally goes down, we'll have an in-person get together, just a picnic or a party somewhere. Otherwise, uh, see you all in September. So uh, thank, thank you all. Uh, congratulations to EG and to John. All right, so long everybody. Bye-bye. Thanks, Barry. Thank you.